So, welcome to our second Book of the Month series uh, event. Um, and welcome to the Berlin Stoics. I think, though, everybody here has been here before. Alvaro, Nelly, and Gonzalo, I see here. I see you guys here all the time. Uh, Ali, I think you've been here once or twice before. Um, yes. so, so yeah, so you're, you're a little used to our discussion formats. Um, if you've never been to a Book of the Month, that is, uh, that's all right. And if you haven't read the book or read only part of the book, that's also okay. The point here is to, I can also pose questions and pick out some parts of the book that you guys might not have read and then read them and we can discuss them here in the, in the meetup. Um, you guys can also pull from parts of the book that you might've read. If you haven't read the book, feel free to ask questions about passages we read or parts that we take from. That's perfectly fine. We ask for everybody to participate if you want to. Um, doesn't matter if you read the book or not. Um, the point is, is that at, at the very least, I read the book and that, you know, so I can at least host and serve the discussion and guide the discussion if need be. Um, this week's book was, and I do not have the cover because I keep the, the, the cover back at home, the cover slip so I can carry around the hard copy without damaging it, um, was The Practicing Stoic by Ward Farnsworth. Is this right side? on Amazon Stoic books and this came up. So I'm really happy I found this. Um, I think this is, we're gonna come back to some introductory books on Stoicism in the future, one year down the line, so that we can help, you know, if, if anybody interested in Stoicism learning about it for the first time gets used to it again. Um, but um, uh, I think for the next few months, we're gonna try and stay away from basic introductory books on Stoicism. I think this is the last one. This is only the second time we've done a book of the month, but this will be the last time we do something introductory um, because I think the idea is to kind of scale up from that, but also kind of branch out into kind of other media, not just books summarizing a philosophy, but also um, uh, essays about um, people's struggles in wartime, people's struggles in with disabilities, people's struggles with, um, uh, or opportunities in, um, distributing wealth, common welfare, things like that, practicing the stoic virtues, so real life examples of that. Um, hi. Um, sorry about that, guys, I'm still at school. Uh, video chatting from here, so um, I can burn the oil without having to go all the way home first. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, and at the end of this book of the month review, I'll also announce, uh, any of the others by Donald Robertson, Massimo Piliucci, um, uh, uh, wow, names escape me, um, but any of the other common introductory books of Stoicism, this is quite different. This is a different format. So instead of usually in an introduction to Stoicism, you have different chapters and every chapter would be based around um, maybe a different element of Stoicism like um, Commonly, sometimes they separate it into physics, ethics, and logic. Um, sometimes they, they, they talk about main ethical principles only without discussing logic or physics, like for example, um, the dichotomy of control, um, uh, judgments, emotions. Um, this case is a little bit different. Um, instead of summarizing stoicism, uh, what he does is um, uh, he will take um, several broad, broad concepts of Stoicism that trans, that, that kind of um, Um, kind of collecting different Stoic voices and passages from their works and then collecting them under one 
if they if Seneca and Epictetus talked about how to manage your judgments of, of external things, then he would put those same passages in the same chapter next to each other. Um, if other philosophers did the same, they wrote about judgments or emotions, he would put Montaigne's or um, uh, Adam Smith's or Plutarch's uh, words on judgments and emotions in the same chapter, the same title. So it's, it's uh, I think, a little bit more interesting than a typical introduction to Stoicism. Uh, so that's my spiel. That's my introductory spiel to this. Um, I'm not paid by the author. I'm not trying to sell the book. So, um, but I, I think it's just worth it to give a short introduction of, of what I think and why I kind of chose it. Um, also, because it's also worthwhile to ask why this book, um, why another introduction, and that that was the reason why. Just it's just interesting because this book you're not really reading the the author's comments on it in com in completion. You're reading the source material just cut up into different fragments. So, um, yeah. Um, for those of you who have read it, for those of you who have read it in part, I wanna open it up to you guys. Um, what struck you interesting about the book? How did you enjoy the book? Um, But without telling you what's the point of view on the thing, uh, kind of like he tries to show you all of the size of these things, and then it makes like a really small uh, phrase to kind of like sinking the, the the whole point on on the thing. And I I think it's really fun that kind of like uh, never learns what it's taught, always thinking something different. Uh, so I really think that this is helping me instead of kind of like slipping through. Um, other sort of topics, I, I think it's helping me to be really focused on on the topics, let's say, and, and also new ways of thinking and practicing stoicism. I, I'm really loving it, especially with the level of kind of like detail that he's using with the words. I, I'm really into words. I, I really like the way that this book is written. Um, I, I I've, I'm connected with this book, sorry. I'm also not paid by the by the author, uh, but I, I think it has a, like a way of explaining things and showing things in a way that um, really strikes my core. Um, so I kind of like like it a lot. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. I actually would have. Um, I think in the future, I would recommend this book rather than the other books. I mean, there's an extent to which you may want to read another one of those other classical introductory dis introduction to Stoicism books by um, uh, um, by some of those main authors, Robertson, um, uh, Piliucci, Whiting, Kai Whiting. But those are good introductions of the Stoic philosophy in, its, in, cla in classical Greece, in how they taught, in um, uh, in short history of it um, and how they studied all logic, you know, physics and, and, and ethics. This book doesn't do that. This book comes from a point of view of um, what are the concerns of Stoicism? Uh, existentialism is about um, uh, um, uh, either thinking of the future, um, thinking about death. Um, uh, for the phenomenologists, it was all about um, sub, um, subjectivity and objectivity, how um, your perception of the world um, changes the reality of the world, you're, you're seeing. Um, whereas Stoicism is more about um, um, management, managing, managing your emotions, and and from that managing of your judgments about the external world, um, how you can how you can see reality from there. 
um, how you can assent to to certain truths and um, come to an understanding of yourself and, and others. Um, so it's it's topics of discussion. I think per, I think for me, um, I would have liked to read this first um, uh, because I think it does a better job of explaining what the Stoics wanted to deal with than just give me a sh just, then just giving me a short introductory lesson on the history and life and philosophy of the Stoics from a third person point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ali. Yeah, I think that what I liked, as you already mentioned, the, uh, the name is uh, actually tell uh, the practicing Stoic. So it's like um, a very um, obvious uh, lessons that you can take and you use uh, from the book uh, daily, and there is a, there are very useful ideas that you can uh, immediately apply um, in your daily life. For example, comparison. go ahead and take some of the ideas and if you apply uh, some of the ideas immediately you will already see the benefits of the book and in your daily life that's very very useful you don't need to know much about the, uh, the stoics themselves but you can directly use their ideas um, i think i like this yeah nelly Uh, Nelly, you had your hand raised. You're muted also. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, thank you for organizing these uh, these uh, book clubs. Uh, I, I think I, I can speak for uh, the beginners because I do think I'm a beginner. And uh, just to give you a feedback on, because I've attended your last month and also this month's book club, I, as a beginner, I would say this book, I wouldn't consider it as a beginner's book. Uh, I would rather consider it as more of an advanced, uh, even like perhaps like uh, somebody as a reference book, uh, kind of, uh, not for beginner. Because for me, I find the previous, uh, you recommended four books in the previous uh, month, and I read only two. Um, and I, I, I actually tried three, but I, I dropped one and I finished the other two. And I really enjoyed the, the two I read, uh, which gave me a beginner, uh, a pretty good understanding of what. I find it very, very difficult to read these um, uh, from different, different author on, on it, it. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Just, just, a, just a feedback for you. No, thank you very much though. I mean, it's, it's good to have your opinion though, because like, if I'm, if I'm saying, oh, this is great as an introduction to stoicism, which maybe for an advanced person, it is like, it's a reference book for, for introductory principles on stoicism, but that's not the same thing as an introduction to stoicism. As you said, I really like the way you call it. It's a reference book. Like, oh, I have this, uh, I really feel anxious about um, this thing that I really want in life. Okay, so you go to the book on desire and then you pick out one of the 10 things it lists uh, about how to um, deal with strong desires and attachments to things that you don't know. And yeah, so I, I completely, okay, so, that that also gives me perspective because maybe
it was just a bunch of passages, it would be different. But the fact that they, he lists like 10 to 12 different um, items, either problems or solutions to your problems, uh, each chapter, it can be overwhelming, I guess, for somebody beginning to understand the philosophy um, that you are overwhelmed with 10 or 12, like a list of 10 or 12 things about this one principle of stoicism. That's like already a lot to remember. And, in, and like, for example, I think the custom is that um, uh, when I teach, there's a custom for teachers. And I think for anybody doing a presentation that's thrown around that you limit the list to five or six things at the most when you're advertising, when you're giving a presentation or teaching a lesson to people, because um, the max number of things that on average people can remember is five to six. And if you're reading a, one of these chapters of 10 to 12 bullet points of just desire, for example, since we're on that topic, um, hello, um, that can be um, that can be overwhelming. I can understand. Um, so, I, yeah, no, thank you because it, it it gives me input as to exactly what um, uh, what people think is is this useful for, and this sounds like it's more useful for reference than it is for just straight up reading. Um, I. I, I like reading this from front to cover, from front cover to back cover, but um, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily how it should be used or how sh it, other people would like to use it. Actually, um, you're, you made a similar comment then as a, um, uh, another Stoic colleague that I uh, met a couple of weeks ago who also said that um, he never read this book back front to cover but he only has used it in certain cases when he needs to pop into a certain chapter because of a certain problem and look up, read a few passages about the problem or the, or the remedy. And I think that it makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, actually, a really good example I wanted to pull was the, actually, he says this very explicitly how he splits up the chapter like that. Um, on the chapter five on desire, um, the first five, are kind of problems of desire, like insatiability of desires, um, appetites, uh, unnatural appetites, uh, chasing versus having, um, disgust with possession, a feeling of disgust with possession, uh, envy, um, uh, and then number six, he turns from the problems. He says very explicitly, we turn from the stoic diagnosis um, to the stoic diagnosis of desire to its remedies. So he says very explicitly, like he has split this chapter up between those problems that we feel with desire and those remedies that we can use to fix our problems with desire, um, which I think is great. I think it's great, a great concept to structure a book like that every chapter. But I also think it lends, lends credence to your idea, Nelly, that this book is really mainly for references. Um, oh, I have a problem. Go to the first part of the chapter to look, about, look up some of the problems, and then go to the second part of the chapter to look about uh, look up some of the remedies for the for those problems. Um, yeah, Alvaro. Yes, sorry, sorry if you hear a lot of background noise. I am back in New York City, and there are a lot of sirens here. Uh, but I wanted to, to speak about my experience with the book as I think it was actually what introduced me to Stoicism. Even though I didn't end up reading the book, I did purchase it on Audible and Kindle. And I remember coming across a passage from Epictetus at the time, and it spoke to my life. And that's how I was like, I have to know more about this philosophy. And the book itself, making reference to many of the philosophers, and namely, in this case, Epictetus, um, so many references to so many uh, primary sources on Stoicism. That's what actually what ignited in me, the idea of searching for more information on Stoicism. So I think uh, it is paradoxical that, you know, I picked up the book, I, I, it spoke to me and I didn't continue reading it, but I was like, I have to know more about this because my perception was, as you mentioned, this is maybe too much of a beginner book. Let me go to the primary sources. Let me know more about this. 
so it is paradoxical that I didn't continue reading it. I think as a beginner, it, it, it helped me because it made me go to the primary sources. And looking back, uh, being somebody who's not an expert, but is more uh, informed now about the stoicism, I can indeed appreciate the fact that uh, when you try to go into more of the uh, like the primary sources and uh, the epistemology of the stoicism, it can get really, really complex. So I think this book really hits the sweetest spot in which it is not fitting you with things that are that are extremely simple, but it's but it's also not overwhelming you or drowning you with a lot of information. So it's just enough as for you to. Uh, get familiar with primary sources, uh, and and uh, and yeah, it's it's. I think it's right right in the middle of the road. I, I think it's a really really good book. I feel that when I want to see more books that were more elaborate, uh, I have lost uh, interest because it it gets too philosophical. Uh, on the other hand, I also felt that the beginner books that we have uh, gone over. Uh, I am not saying that they, they are bad, but maybe w what I lose hard with is the fact that it is actually modern stoicism. And I feel that modern stoicism still differs very much from traditional stoicism. And this book really does a good job sticking to the traditional roots of the philosophy. While not being um, distant from it, you know, I think, um, yeah, so I, I like what you said. So there are two things just to echo um so it's uh it, it sticks to the traditional platform of the stoic philosophy but i don't think it necessarily means that it um it it is foreign to us or it's non-modern like um uh maybe there's a lot of stoic physics that are clearly um principles that they believed in that um knowing the scientific knowledge we know today um we would never we would likely not assent to um, but yeah, he presents the stoic ethics in a way that seems relatable today, but also because he quotes the stoics seems also traditional. Um, and the other second, the second thing you said was that, um, I think you offered a more balanced opinion about, um, so we, we talked about how this book could be used as an introduction to stoicism, but maybe it is overwhelming. Um, and, um, uh, and didactic in terms of just giving you the, the primary sources. So maybe best use as a reference. Um, but I also think um, that even if it's advanced, you're an advanced experienced person, um, you're right. When you refer to this book, um, the, the language used is not difficult. And the problems and the principles he talks about, the problems that the Stoics dealt with, the solutions they gave, um, are very down to earth. Um, it's something anybody, I think, uh, may maybe beyond somebody who's really just beginning, but even people who are a couple months into un understanding it, practicing it, and to those who are really experienced with it, I think of most experience levels, this is a really useful book. Um, I had a follow-up question for you guys. So past the point of kind of just introductory, uh, what do you think of it? Um, did anybody have a particular chapter that they really enjoyed? Because um, I think there's these chapters, there's something different about some of them. Some of them are very unique. Some of them are very similar, especially the first couple, but some of them are very unique. Um, and they go deeper into certain principles as you keep going. Um, I think when you get to emotion and, and learning and that virtue, that's when it gets broad again. Um, but in the middle, you get these really specific chapters on desire, wealth, pleasure, death. Um, but overall, did you guys have any particular chapter you enjoyed more than the others? Or might have helped you with a, with a problem you have more than the others? In my case, when I resorted to the book, I think I went to the chapter on what other people think uh, of us or of me in this case. And uh, yeah, I, I think it spoke to me. It's, it, it really addressed uh, my concerns back then. 
uh, that as I mentioned, it made me want to, to know more about the philosophy. Yeah, Gonzalo. Um, fair warning, I've only read until chapter three, page 80 inside the Kindle box, so inside the Kindle, so I haven't uh, really advanced. I'm taking a lot of time um, to consume this book. Um, it's uh, kind of like, I think it's something that you need to read really slow uh, in order to fully, or at least maybe I'm slow and kind of like that's the thing that it's uh, keeping me trapped. Uh, but I think that it's, um, uh, the, I think that the, the one on externals, it's the chapter that pretty much kind of like, um, Somehow, some, somehow, kind of like, uh, made me understand. Like, oh, you're screwed in that way. Oh, nice. I see it now. Great. Nice to see that. Uh, kind of like, it's it's a really hard and difficult problem to observe. Uh, kind of like what's really external in your control and what's really inside your control, even with other things and other people. And kind of like, I I, I think that that was uh, the until I read it so far, it's the really best one for me. Yeah, I think also um, when he gets like the first chapter on judgments is a good starter chapter, but then when he gets to externals is when you start to understand his pattern. Um, like the first two chapters are set up very well because they're two sides of the same coin. And I think he pointed that out. Judgments are about things internal Sure, internal judgments about the external world and externals are about those things that we attach externally um, that we don't need. So judgments are about those things within our power and externals are about things outside of our power. I think it's nice to open up the book with two chapters about the dichotomy of control without ever mentioning the dichotomy of control. You know, judgments about those things within our power and externals about those things outside of our power, which is why I think he phrases it like that. Judgments are things internal so we can deal with them and and and, and change them, and um, we don't need to agree with them or assent to them. And externals are those things we need to detach to. That's why I think externals. He talks about attachment a lot, um, and I think those first two chapters are a really great opener to the book. Uh, yeah, Ali. Uh, yeah, in my uh, case, I I think I like more in the desire part because. I always like um, I, um, just expecting something that I will achieve and then I will be happy and that 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 thing I need to achieve that one then I go to the next one then uh, next one so it never ends and it you are always expecting something and it um, drives you crazy and uh, so this uh, I think. Uh, uh, you need to uh, expect less, and then you uh, you will be happy more, and that, 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 that's uh, and you need to. Um, there are a lot of things that you will not achieve probably, and uh, there are a lot of things that you don't have control to achieve them, and that's the you 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 understand uh, that you don't need. Um, this there are a lot of illusion in your in your mind that uh, you think that uh, the externals make you happy and you want them so that that's I think it helps a lot when you read and you map to yourself and you see that okay my happiness comes from actually inside from my brain yeah, but to be sure, we live in a society that kind of like is shoving that thing in your face, right? It's telling you all the time, kind of like, ah, you need a couch to be happy now in watching TV. And after that, it's like, oh, you need like a new TV to see everything in 8K or whatever. And then it's, it's kind of like, uh, I think that one side of the coin related to the sire is that we live in a really sick society that is shoving you consumption every day to your face and kind of like you're reacting to that um and i think that that's kind of like the natural thing for us to happen that it's like after you have consumed all of it you said like oh shit, none of it is making me happy what the fuck am i supposed to do um 
So uh, to, to me, I think it's like really cool that uh, at, at least you start with the with the noticing part. Then, um, to to be honest, I kind of like I'm still being in the noticing part. I don't think that uh, most of the time you just do that. You notice, and with noticing, it's completely for me. It's completely enough. It's like oh, nice, and that's it. I don't think that you should kind of like try to not to expect some expect something. I think that just by noticing, like oh, okay, I have an expectation here. Uh, is it prefer to be something else? Okay, perfect. It's like indifferent or not, or yeah, I will suffer in this way. Yeah, I think I think it's also, um, oh yeah, Nelly, I see you. Um, and uh, so just a quick word, just to bounce off though. Um, yeah, because I wanted to mention something. Um, I'm trying to find a passage. There's, a, I feel like there was a specific passage in here, but I pulled out an example anyway. So on the example of the ch when he talks in the chapter on wealth and pleasure, um, uh, on page the hard copy page. So I'm not sure about Kindle. Uh, um, One fifteen, uh, Seneca. So this is actually point. So maybe you could follow along. Point nine uses of pleasure in chapter six. Um, the title is called Uses of Pleasure. And so I think he wants to convey the fact that the Stoics didn't just want you to basically ignore your pleasures, ignore the things that uh, externals that could be preferred and make you happy. Um, I think the point was that um, I, I can't find it in here. But yeah, so the first point is that, yeah, um, they shouldn't make you happy. They should add to your life. But they that you shouldn't be dependent on them or rely on reliable on them for happiness exclusively. And the other thing is is that I think Seneca Seneca especially makes the effort to say that actually you shouldn't just you know you know try for pleasure or you know um, um, attempt to include some pleasures in your life. Um, uh, he makes he makes the added. Um, uh, um, I don't want to say principle, um, but comment that actually it's it's helpful, it's beneficial if you have some pleasures in your life. Um, the mind must not be kept invariably at the same tension, but must be diverted to amusements. Um, Socrates did not blush to play with little children. Um, Cato would relax mind with wine when it was wearied by the cares of state. And Scipio would stir his triumphal and soldierly person to the sound of music. Um, he comments on it. Seneca regarded sports and play as natural pleasures as well. Um, so um, I think it's useful that there are some pleasures, there are some things that we want to attain, that we want to include in our lives. Sure, treat them as indifference, in preferred indifference, because you don't want to depend on those if you can't have those or can't get those. Uh, you don't want to depend on those for a good life or be happy. Um, but the Stoics didn't just say they're preferred. Some of the Stoics actually said they were actually good to include it in their lives because sometimes um, having these, um, what he called natural pleasures, um, uh, things that are very natural for us as human, whatever age we're in to, to be accustomed to music, games, um, even a little bit of drinking, he was mentioning some of his fellow senators were doing. Um, it's quite nice to hear a Stoic to say that um, there's a difference between completely detaching from something um, um, exclusively, that is, um, without the intention and perhaps purposefully avoiding that thing um, because, oh, we shouldn't be dependent on it, to Seneca saying, oh, well, actually, um, going 100% in that direction isn't so great. You don't want to purposefully avoid something because Indifference, just like how you can't necessarily attain it, you can't necessarily avoid it either. Um, if you happen upon a situation where you're involved in an environment which is with a pleasure, if you can't avoid music if any time you walk around, um, then you should be okay with being in that situation. You just can't rely on it. So if it ever goes away, it's, um, yeah. So I, I think it's good to have that balance effect you guys are saying that, um, the Stoics painted this picture of um, uh, externals, attachment, uh, detachment, excuse me, but also detachment from externals, but also um, 
the idea that um, you can endorse some pleasures, um, but remember not to be dependent on them. Uh, Nelly. Yeah, so I don't really have a particular subject that I find particularly helpful to me because I think this is a very advanced book, but I find the structure of the book interesting that the author in the end included a chapter on learning, which I think uh, is rather clever because uh, at, at first when I saw learning, I thought of learning because I'm currently studying some, some things and it's totally not uh, related to how you study. It's really a summary of how you should learn all the previous uh, subjects, I think. So, um, so after he discussed all these uh, topics, he included in chapter 12, a uh, chapter on learning, how uh, you, know, you can reinforce all these. Um, so that's all, because I guess it's a practic practicing Stoic. So that's probably why he included this chapter. That's all. No, yeah, thank you. That's that's a really good point. I really like that. Yeah, the fact that he included that chapter. Yeah, because you're right. He's asking the question, well, a practicing Stoic probably wants to know how to learn these things. You know, reading them in the book is OK, but he gives he needs to give practical examples of what the Stoics did. Um, they meditated. Um, they watched, but that whole watching section isn't about um, watching somebody else do it. Um, he asked people to visualize yourself doing it um, while you're watching somebody else. Um, actually, I think I think there's another name for that technique: um, the ability to um, uh, practice in your mind over and over again. Um, uh, athletes do it. I know that athletes sometimes do it. Um, when they're on the train or when they're kind of going to practice, coming back from practice, they continue training in their heads. Um, and also the idea of, of course, watching other people do it is great, um, but it's um, it has a stoic spin on it, a very mental stoic spin on it. Um, what's another one, actually? Uh, Actually, there was the first one, yeah, review. There was one, I think there was the first one that was called review or repetition. Uh, yeah, it was the first one, review. The Stoics offer many techniques for improving the quality of one's thinking. Um, one of them is to set philosophical goals and keep track of progress in reaching them. Um, a nightly review of how the day went from a Stoic standpoint. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not exactly the kind of studying techniques that you learn in school that help you get through a test, right? Oh, review for the test. Um, no, what he's, uh, what review for the Stoics meant was um, reviewing your day and reviewing how it went and reviewing whether you could have done better or how you how you performed virtuously or unvirtuously, for un unvirtuously over the day. So yeah, you make a good point, Nelly, that it's learning, but it's also learning specifically these these stoic teachings that, um, of course, you can apply them in other areas of your life, but it's um, it's a kind of an educational Bible, or call it that, but maybe an educational primer on how to how to learn stoic principles and practice. It's a really good point. Uh, actually, the learning chapter can apply to other non-stoic uh, also. It, it's it's very uh, it's very well written. Nice. I'm looking forward to reading it like next year, maybe, or something. <laughs> Sounds really good. But I, I think what we've gathered today is that, um, I mean, bouncing off this thing, um, this, this, the, calling this a reference that Nelly used in the very beginning is that um, uh, skip to it. <laughs> you know, if you want to skip to it, you know, finish the chapter you're on, but then skip to it. Skip to it and read a little bit of it. And then you can, you can apply those that the learning techniques the Stoics used for those chapters that you read. No, but to be honest, that's kind of like my thing. I, I, I'm used to skipping things and going kind of like I skip a lot of stages and a lot of different things. And now I'm trying to kind of like procedurally go to from uh, the beginning to the end. So kind of like my practice right now, it's kind of like we should consume it in order. Uh, so that's kind of like it. I think that's, I think that's a very good point. The one that Nelly makes, I, 
I would certainly go to that chapter, which I didn't know if I would have ever reached if she didn't bring it up. But it makes me wonder also why he didn't put it at the beginning rather than at the end of the book. You make a really good point. I guess if you think of it like that, that it's something that you could use for any of the chapters to apply um, if why he didn't put it at the beginning of the book. Um, Good question. Oh, but Gonzalo, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Um, the, the only thing that I can say is that it's something that my, my, my kind of like my mindfulness uh, teacher used to tell me, kind of like the first thing that you need to do is to learn to observe your thoughts. Just kind of like that's the beginning of things. You, you could think that um, you could start anywhere, like uh, from tolerance or practice or kind of like endurance, but the first thing that you need to master is observing your thoughts. Maybe that's kind of like the way that mindfulness works and, and that sort of thing. But he told me that after that you have done that, the rest of them will start kind of like making a little bit more sense after that you start practicing all of them. So probably it's an order related to um, a, a way of like training your mind into getting into the point that the last thing that you need to remember is that this is a learning experience and you have to you have to master all of these things by practicing them. So kind of like for me, the index makes a lot of sense in, in, in some real way. Um, yeah, but yeah, great. Great chapter to include in it. Yeah, I really agree. Um, it, it culminates, it culminates in a very, in like a crescendo. It finally, like you get through adversity and you finally get to the crux of stoicism, virtue. And then you finally get to the crux of how to actually attain virtue or practice these principles, learning. So maybe, maybe, maybe Gonzalo has a point about putting it in the, in the, in the end. Although I don't, I don't think that putting it in the beginning would have been necessarily a bad thing. Just, I think maybe it depends on, um, your point of reference if you want to know how to learn. Um, but um, then if you put it in the beginning, I would have wanted to also put it in the end, double the chapter, because um, you need to you need to constantly observe how you're actually learning um, things and, and constantly come back to that, um, those techniques, um, because I don't think it would be useful to only do it in the beginning. And you need to also review it at the end um, to see if you can practice the principles you're taught. Um, I uh, have probably made it. Sorry. Uh, I have probably made it an appendix, just so that it stands out. It, because again, when I picked up the book, I was like, I want to learn more about this. I, I I not only want to read about the stoicism, I want to become a stoic myself. Had I known that chapter was there, maybe I would have known. I would have not gone looking for other resources. I, I I would actually disagree more with that. If it was in an appendix, it wouldn't stand out. I think it would because I, I I see what you're saying because it's like it set apart from the other chapters, so it stands out. But to me, when I see an appendix, I say, oh, that's not necessary to read. I don't have to read that. So I think more for for a lot of people, if if you if if he had put it as an appendix, people would have kind of ignored it and said, yeah, but I read the book. The appendices were optional. Whereas if you put it as a chapter, it's kind of like mandatory reading. If you want to get through the entire book, you have to read the chapter on learning. So I feel like, I feel like it's kind of a, an unconscious thing you do when you see, at least for me, when I see appendices, I always say to myself, "Yeah, but that's optional. I don't. I can refer to that if I need to. I don't need to though." Um, um, I wanted to point out the chapter that stuck out to me, and that was specifically because there was a time frame of this summer, sometime in July, August. Um, it ended in about mid July, in mid August, but there was a time frame of sometime in, sometime in July and August when I had this dark, deep anxiety, and I don't know why. This is one of those things that kind of just came up out of nowhere. Um, anxiety about death, um, because so. A, 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 a stoic theme is that you you premeditate death and you and you don't just contemplate your own death you contemplate everybody's death around you because you need to meditate on preparing for those deaths and accepting how grateful you are for for the things around you already 
but you also meditate on your own death because it could happen at any moment. Ironically, a, meditating on this actually made me a bit more anxious. This was actually one of the times when I realized how subjective some of these tools are, the Stoics give. That for me personally, meditating on the idea that you can, you know, you can die at any time and therefore you need to use every moment to your advantage and take every opportunity to the best to, to the best you can because you don't know when you're going to die. Um, uh, actually inadvertently made me more anxious. That did not help me because it kind of put me at ease. Because it kind of put me at, at, at an ease. Oh, wait, I could die at any moment. You know, I, I didn't really feel like that was at the best tool for me to kind of get over that hurdle, to kind of take advantage of the time I have and accept the fact that I that, that death is inevitable and um, ever present. Um, so there was a, I wanted to point out kind of a part of the chapter that stood out to me, that kind of made me feel, I think there were a couple of things that made me feel a better, better at ease with death, but there were a couple of things the Stoics said about death that stood out because I have never heard of those arguments before. Um, I, I like this one, uh, number, so if, if you guys wanna, wanna reference these in your own book uh, copy, um, number three, part D. He cuts this number into parts. So number three, part D, is in David. Um, comparisons to the time before birth. Uh, and Seneca, Seneca quotes, um, uh, what I say to myself, does death so often test me? Let it do so. I myself have for a long time tested death. When, you ask, before I was born. Unless I am mistaken, my dear Lucilius, we go astray in thinking that death follows when it has both preceded and will follow. Whatever condition existed before our birth was death, which I think is a, is a poignant statement to make because I think Seneca is, 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 is making a good counter assumption. Uh, this is, I think, one of the elements. There's a couple of others I can name, but I wanted to make this stand out that um, uh, he, he knows that often we think of before birth and after death completely different states of being. Um, but he, he, I think he's recognizing that we're all assuming that um, we know what death is and that we know that, you know, the being, the being dead, being in a state of death is a different kind of existence than being in a state before birth. Um, and for him, uh, he's saying, well, wait, 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 wait. Um, they're, they are, they are different. They are, they are not as different as you think because and Alv so Al Alvaro or anybody else, if you guys have religious beliefs, um, I'll, I, th I think this is somewhat compatible only to the extent that um, if you, if you prove, if, if you base your knowledge on before birth or after death purely on your observational capabilities, so purely based on our empirical powers to observe what goes on, to scientifically study birth, uh, before birth and after death, um, based on those capabilities humans have, I think Seneca is correct. There's no way to distinguish um, and kind of before birth state of being and an after death state of being, because we just have no scientific capability of understanding what that is. We don't know what after death is. We don't know what before birth is. So he kind of makes this equality between them almost. And that kind of puts me a little bit more at ease because I, if I've been there already, going back there is no problem. So for me, it was if, you know, if I had any anxiety about before birth, I would have it after death because if I, but if I didn't have any anxiety, you know, about, oh, wait, what was I feeling before birth? I wasn't anxious about that. So why should I be anxious about what, what I feel after death? And that kind of put me a bit more at ease with the idea of impending doom because we know we can never be sure when it's going to happen. Um, Gonzalo and then and then Alvaro. Uh, kind of like, uh, I think that one of the things is um, related to how you observe life and what do you think about your own life. It's it's what the thing that creates anxiety about death. If you, uh, at least that's the thing that ha happened to me. Kind of like I was uh, told since I was really really young that. Um, I should achieve uh, things, I should perform, I should um, 
create things for the world and do a lot of good for the world because I was put in this world to be good and whatever. Um, and kind of like, I always felt this sort of pressure that somebody else have given to me. It's kind of like, ah, so somebody randomly throw me into this space and now I have to come up with results about something that I don't know what it is. It's kind of like, um, that sort of way of thinking previously created a lot of anxiety related to my, I could be hitting by a car in the next five minute things. It's like, oh shit, I will be judged. And I, th did I accomplish the thing that somebody else has put me in this place? Um, until kind of like, I started to um, kind of like reverse that sort of thought in the sense of like, no, 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 wait. Uh, this is kind of like my time in, in this space, it's like if nothing is outside and the only thing that I have is this five minutes, did I did the best that I could according to my own rules? Uh, maybe for me, it was like watching a bird for five minutes until the car crashed me. Uh, but that's kind of like the way that I enjoy it. I, I think that most of the times we tend to forget that part that it's like, oh, because we have this really shitty society that it's always telling you like produce produce mass produce do something generate money um you have to perform you have to earn you have to do a lot of things because we have like this sort of uh competency going on in the world i think that most of the times we are blind to that thing that it's like oh i really like to enjoy sunset so that's in, that's kind of like the end of the day for me um and kind of like that's the way that i think that i'm um, let's say using wisely my own life, um, and any and kind of like that's my choice. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. That's kind of like the thing that I like to do, uh, and and I think that that's the thing that at least to me created this sort of like peace related to that. It's like oh yeah, I can be hit by a car now. It's like yeah, it's fine. Uh, not that I want to be hit by a car, but <laughs> kind of like at least I'm at peace with that thing. Um, because the other thing was the quote that I think I share on the group uh, a few moments ago, well, a few moments, um, in September the, the, the 2nd, that it says, um, you don't have to turn this into something. It doesn't have to accept you. I think that that really resonated with me, with me back then, uh, because it kind of like showed this. It's, it's kind of like, oh, it doesn't have to upset me, the fact that it's my choice and I can enjoy it as ever as I like. Um, and just like that, it's, I, I don't have to make it anything. I don't have to create the next scientific discovery that will, I don't know, create humans going into space or whatever, or the next atomic bomb to destroy everything, <laughs> who knows? But uh, kind of like, I just, it doesn't have to upset me. I think that that's a really slow clap for me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> And um, no, yeah, thank you. But also it's, yeah, I, I could, so, so I understand like it's, um, and I think this specific example was a really good one because it is, it's a very, very subjective according to which person is actually understanding death. Um, it's just that kind of thing that is interpreted by people very differently. And so is um, dealt with very differently by different people. Um, like, like you said, like you feel a lot more comfortable saying you can be hit by a bus at any moment and be like, so what? Like, it's just, it's just that. For me, that provided me more anxiety than not, but um, Alvaro. Yes, I'm sorry, my connection dropped. Uh, my intention was to turn on the camera because I thought it's a very sensitive subject, but uh, I don't feel I am looking my best today, so my apologies for that. Uh, but I just wanted to comment on the subject. I, I feel that not necessarily the Stoics, but when I have been into other Stoic meetings from other groups, I feel that people tend to romanticize suicide when they, they speak about the subject of death. Uh, maybe because Seneca uh, took his own life and, um, and apparently it was not rare for people uh, in the Greco-Roman culture to commit suicide. Uh, but I think it is, it is very important to highlight a couple of things. First, that uh, uh, the context of these people is very different to ours. I mean, if we're speaking about Seneca, who is the tutor of 
uh, Caesar or Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor, or even Epictetus being a slave, like the idea for them to take their own life, maybe in their culture and their context is different to ours. I also think it is important to realize that this is not therapy. And if somebody is thinking, you know, if we're speaking about that, it's certainly not a, we're, we're not trying to incentivize anybody to take in their own life in the context of uh, that being discussed in the stoicism. Uh, uh, but I know you didn't mention suicide, uh, Steve, and may, maybe going back to, to the idea of that, uh, I think the best, the best, uh, the best phrase that I, I think it exemplifies what I understand, what Stoicism is trying to make us think with thinking about our own passing, is maybe uh, that famous speech given by St Steve Jobs at Stanford. Uh, it was a commencement speech in which he mentions to the audience, we are already naked. And it was the idea of telling people hey, you don't have anything to lose in your life. Go and take some risk. So that's a whole idea of contemplating our own death, more than, more than suggesting that taking our own life will make a difference, or more than suggesting that if we take our own life, uh, you know, nothing terrible is gonna happen to us. I think it's the idea that what is strength, what is strength free? We don't have any attachments in this life, and we should go ahead and live our life accordingly without any fears. But uh, the point also being that we don't have any control over that. We don't know what is in the afterlife for sure. We don't know what preceded us. So why, why think about it so much? So if we only have control about the now and our lives now, just focus on that. Uh, but I just wanted to make that emphasis uh, I do I do see that a lot of people, uh, myself included, resort to stoicism because we're in debt, uh, going through anxiety or other things that usually are addressed by psychology and maybe when we encounter something that has to do with life and that, uh, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't want to uh, prescribe ourselves and, and to do something that we think the philosophy is suggesting and that I don't think is the intent and I don't think it's like the idea in, in today's also a uh, data and age. No, yeah, thank you. But that's also that also makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's also why worth worry, why why be why why worry about even even if you believe in an afterlife, why worry about what that afterlife is like if you just don't know? Um, which is also a good point. Um, I think for me. Uh, but I, I also wanted to bounce off of you. I think for me, the point, the anxiety came from, and I, I was reflecting on this in my journal that it was less about what happens after death and, and more about losing the life. So I was less anxious about, oh, it's the unknown, what is death? And I was more anxious about, wait, once I die, I no longer can do the things and feel the things that I do during life. So for me, the anxiety was more about losing something rather than gaining, rather than what comes up next. And I think that's perhaps why I needed some different techniques to deal with it. Um, because if like, if we take one of your examples of, oh, we don't have to worry about what happens after death because we just don't know, or um, yeah, but if we die tomorrow from a bus, what does it matter? It's, you know, it's, it's, but for me, those techniques I think didn't work in the end because I was more worried about losing what I have now than worried about gaining some, or, or turn, you know, opening a new door, op you know, go, going through a new door and um, entering a new chapter in existence. And for me, that was, um, that was why I think it required something a little bit different um, that um, I needed, yeah. No, no, I, I completely understand. I think we mentioned at some our meeting, there is another technique in which you're basically thinking about the worst case I don't know the name of the technique, but it's basically you are thinking about the worst case and you're putting yourself in that worst case, right? Uh, are, are you guys familiar with that technique? Do you guys remember that? Which basically, like, if, if you think that the worst that can happen to you is in, you know, in a certain scenario, so and so, then you visualize yourself in that circumstance. So if that happens, you're already prepared for that. And I, I think I think in the, in that meeting I mentioned that at least for me, 
I don't find that technique useful. It makes me more anxious myself. And uh, in psychology, there is a term for that when when uh, it is catastrophizing, when you have the tendency of thinking that the worst thing is, is what is going to happen. So I completely agree with you, not only with this technique, but with with many others. I'm sure maybe would have some. We, we may have some objections and it may not work for everyone the same. Um, no, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I think that I'm kind of like, this is going to be a hard topic, but kind of like, I, I think that uh, you're referring to two different things. Let's say one of the things is um, the, the compulsion of obsessing over the worst scenario, like I could be hit by a meteorite right now when I'm walking on the street and I could kind of like end my life uh, without really achieving something. Um, that's kind of like one of the things that uh, psychology is usually more um, uh, useful for because you can really understand why you're obsessing too much about that. Other thing is the technique about negative visualization in which you figure out a, a place that you want to go. Um, like, I don't know, I want to go into my car to the, to do a four hour drive. Do I have, um, uh, how, how do you call it? Like a backup, uh, una rueda de auxilio. I forgot the word, sorry. Um, like, like a backup, um, wheel in my in the trunk of my car. Spare wheel, um, spare wheel. Spare wheel. Yeah. Spare mm -hmm. tire. Yeah. Great. Um, that sort of thing. I think it's another topic. Uh, for me, I, I think that the way that I've started to see it right now, it's it's more on the sense of like life is a part of death, and kind of like I cannot see right now. The only thing that I can see is what I know, right? Uh, so let's say my life includes the death or the darks, uh, let's say blanks where I didn't see right? The same amount of atoms that they were here in this planet and this universe before that, they existed all together. I'm just taking them from the ground um, and doing something with them, like growing. Like I can see that in another different way. Maybe I'm slightly kind of like going pretty far. And the same atoms will exist after I die. The only thing that doesn't exist is for my consciousness, let's say, to observe them, but the atoms are right there. So th I think that that's the way that I'm kind of like really calm about the dying. It's like, yeah, physics, nothing can be destroyed. Uh, so at least I'm kind of like really happy with that subject. And it's like, oh yeah, just my perception of that of the reality and all the things that come with that perception of reality is the thing that it changes um, in the same way that, I don't know, a drop of water drops into the sea. It's like, oh yeah, can you pick up that single drop of water? Do you differentiate that from the whole water or is it not? Uh, but that sort of thing is kind of like more from the Buddhist aspect or rather than the stoicism and science aspect of things. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, we are talking about how we feel about the, I, I think that I think that in one part of it, it's called the perishability of things rather than with the, the things that are always changing and always going through changes. I think that that's the thing that we are trying to talk about and get a little bit better uh, at handling rather than just like saying like, oh yeah, uh, I feel satisfied with hitting by a bus, by being hit with a bus right now, because I think I have accomplished a, a lot of things or no, it's kind of like if something perish around me, I can understand and be really comfortable with that perishing, even though I feel a lot of pain from the perishing of my mother or whatever. I think that's the point. Uh, yeah, just a passing comment on um, just before Ali speaks that 
I think there is a section in the book on perishability. Like when it comes to death, it's, I think it's death for another chapter, but he mentions perishability because I think it's especially Marcus Aurelius of all the Stoic philosophers. Marcus Aurelius especially quotes Heraclitus and talks a lot about change and constant change in the universe and talks about that idea that things are constantly perishing, constantly being renewed and constantly changing into different things. Yeah. Um, uh, Ali. <clears throat> yeah, I really like the, the, the birth example for the death. Uh, when I, uh, uh, listened, I will, I'm listening, uh, I listened to a book, not read, uh, the, um, it, I smiled when I listened that, uh, that, uh, how do you remember your birth or about the, uh, or do you remember before birth and and this is the similar way and um it actually is it's actually good perspective to, uh, about the death so that what it doesn't uh, it matters of course uh, when you will die but it doesn't matter after you die and then um you will not remember anything and it's actually what matters is that how do you act today so how do you act in general in the life and today? And uh, I think that the more difficult uh, about the death is not the death of yourself, it's more like death of your loved ones. So it's more, uh, it will bring more pain than the, the yourself because you will not remember your, your death, but you will remember the death of others. So, um, and it could uh, create a lot of pain and it's, uh, it's maybe, in my opinion, more helpful to visualize this of your loved ones than to to, to yourself um, in that context. Um, yeah, but in general, I, I really, uh, it actually also brings relief in if you uh, think about the, the birth and the death, and it, it says that, okay, that's that's very good actually to don't remember anything and I just need to to do whatever I want to do and I want to act in this life and I that's it the rest is just okay yeah, yeah thank you um yeah this has been a really good discussion about death and it, it's a good summary you made Ali also just going back to some of the principles that each of us mentioned um uh, yeah, so I think I think for me, death was the most interesting chapter, but only because in relation to my personal problem, um, it helped me. Um, but uh, it's it's also it's also has a nice place in the book too. It's placed between the chapters on perspective and desire. So it's 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 placed between the chapters on changing your perspective about something, which makes sense for death, but also of things. Uh, you're um, unnaturally attached to um, your desires. And so um, uh, things, I think the, the other side of the coin of death is why are we so anxious of death? Um, either because we're attached to the idea that um, we can go on living forever um, and attached to the idea that we, um, uh, that um, we have all the time in the world to finish when we don't. Um, yeah, I have follow-up questions on the book also. Um, was there anything you thought was missing from the book? I mean, you don't have to actually, I mean, maybe on the chapters that you guys specifically read, but also on the book as a whole. Like, you don't, if you didn't read the whole book, just looking at the chapters overall, was there anything that you thought was not in the book that should have been? Um, maybe a chapter head, a chapter heading or chapter title that should have been there that wasn't. And it's actually difficult for me to think about because like the, looking at the chapters is not enough. Like, cause every chapter contains so much. It contains so many little subtle principles of stoicism, of practicing stoicism, that it's hard to think of um, cause the whole chapter on desire covers a lot of ground. So in general, I think it's very difficult to think of something missing from the book because you have to think about like 10 different things he says in every one of the chapters. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I have something that I, but I, I, I'm a little bit split on this one because I think it is good and, but at the same time it's it's missing. But I think it's maybe good that it's missing. So when you mentioned the dichotomy of control and that he doesn't make reference of the dichotomy of control directly, he doesn't bring up the term. And you were saying that it, it was actually interesting and I think you also liked it. Uh, I mean, coming from a Christian perspective, there are a lot of things in when you study the Bible that are not in the Bible, but that are Christian theology or doctrine. So it's basically tools that made that were made by men in order to understand the Bible. So if the dichotomy of control was not brought up by any of the Stoics themselves, the term itself, uh, that's probably part of the people who started the philosophy came up with the term, the dichotomy of control in order to explain that, right? So I think it is good that things like that are missing because it's like, you can read the Bible, quote unquote, or you can read the primary sources, or you can approach the stoicism from a fresh perspective in which not you don't have anybody indoctrinating you about the philosophy. You are just reading firsthand from the primary sources and gaining your own understanding. So I think that's very good. On the other hand, maybe in an appendix, it would have been good to have things like, okay, this is the academy of control. These are the four core values of the stoicism and so on. Actually, yeah, I really like, so So I really like what you said in the beginning that actually it might be great that he doesn't use modern jargon about how we interpret or name point principles of Stoic philosophy. But I also, I more so liked what you said about the appendix idea. So the idea that, because actually I thought in the end, it just ends. Like he goes, he, there's, there's chapter after chapter after chapter and then Stoicism and its critics is the last chapter. And then you finish that chapter and you literally see nothing afterwards. You see no comment, no commentary, no summary, no no conclusion, no epilogue, no no appendix. Like here's the bullet points of Stoic philosophy, and I thought that was kind of unfortunate because I I do agree that there should be something afterwards. That there should be either a concluding remark from the author, or um, as you said, I actually like what you said. Maybe there should be like a cheat sheet of two one or two pages where you just have an appendix of quick Stoic principles named there that summarize the things that were mentioned in the book. Would it be nice also, if this is a practicing Stoic book, that would be quite useful to have that, like a, like a cheat sheet uh, summarizing what you learned in the other chapters. Um, uh, and then maybe, maybe labeling which chapter you found those principles in. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. I, I do like that he might've added something. Um, if not an appendix, then maybe a concluding remark. I just thought it ended very abruptly um yeah for for me a little bit more reference to other things that are not necessarily philosophers i think that uh, a lot of the knowledge at at least from from my experience i could see a lot of the knowledge that my buddhist teacher my mindfulness teacher taught me uh the, and and kind of like it it resonated more and more uh, like, oh yeah, that this is that concept over there. Where, why there's no reference to this or that, um, let's say, poem or some other uh, like Buddhist. Um, I think that I forgot his name, wait, and Rumi has like really good um, small poems, small things that help you a little bit uh, with some things. Uh, but maybe on the other hand, as uh, Nelly mentioned, they're kind of like advanced or or they don't really add up really well with the with the whole idea that the author has on the book. So yeah. Yeah. Um I also think that the book is very, very narrowly Stoic philosophy. Um, I think he, I think, I think, I feel like he mentioned this in the preface or the introduction, um, but um, it's also a Stoic ethic book. I think he purposefully avoids a lot of Stoic logic and physics that underlies ethic, the, his, their ethics, um, for good reason, maybe. If you're a practicing Stoic, maybe physics and logic is not 
too useful for you. Um, I think logic is maybe more useful than physics. Um, especially when you um, logically try and analyze your uh, your own psychology, um, which is basically the bulk of Stoic ethics is kind of in practice psychology and applied psychology or fairness, um, you can call it. Um, but yeah, it is also very narrowly Stoic ethics uh, and Stoic philosophy. Um, so yeah, just a comment about the philosophy that you were also mentioning that um, uh, it's... Um, it's a very different take in presenting a philosophy in general. And I think that um, while he does a great job of compiling the Stoic voices, um, and in the introduction and the preface, he does mention a few of the basic Stoic principles or, um, uh, yeah, the, the way in which Stoicism could be considered structure, um, uh, which is great. I really like that introduction too. I think, Gonzalo, you mentioned it a couple of sessions ago, but, um, uh, I think that um, maybe what's missing is for me, some footnotes or some, uh, if not footnotes, literally at the bottom of the page, because that might, that might start filling up too much. Um, but maybe kind of when you ever read a book and you see those collection of notes at the end of the book in a separate section, um, and they tell you chapter one notes, and then they list the notes that have been footnoted from some of the from some of the sentences in the chapter. Um, that would have been nice to also expand on those things that he mentioned in the book um, that he wasn't able to actually fit in. But again, he also he also this is a big project. This is also um, uh, the pages are short, but I think Nelly is correct in the sense that it's it's short but deceptively short. Like there's actually like Gonzalo and Nelly were saying also you should read it slowly. Um, that um, as much as I think that he should have put a little bit more in at the end, um, um, add a little bit more about stoic physics and logic, um, or add a little bit more analysis or commentary on the background of some of these principles by the stoics, already it takes you a slow time to read through because it's just, it's dense. Also, it covers a lot of ground very quickly. Every one or two pages, you're on a completely different principle. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's taxing on your mind to read through this. So I can understand that. Also- Maybe sometimes it's related with uh, English not being my language, even though I kind of like, I've been reading in English for maybe 10 years, but kind of like, it's not my language. I'm not really used to uh, kind of like some structure, some kind of like linguistic structures well, that mostly of the times are used in books. Um, so maybe it's written in a way that it's hard for me to understand because it's not my language. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so as we're winding down, um, there is one last thing before any kind of last minute announcements for the book of the month series um, about the book that I, I thought was interesting and I think could help us in the future. And that's who he quotes. Um, it's not just the non-Stoic philosophers, it's also the Stoic philosophers. So I think this, I think I will take a lot from this as a reference book in terms of, hmm, is there a particular essay, because Seneca has like 40 plus essays and letters. Is there a particular letter or essay by Seneca on a topic that would be of interest to us um, for that theme of the week? And I think this is a great reference. Like there's, there's actually a, an essay already I thought I, to myself actually would be um, yeah, uh, hair, uh, um, would be perfect to read that he, he has quoted, he quoted like, uh, quite numerously on, in one specific chapter. Uh, it's on not the, well, actually that's also interesting. Seneca's on the constancy of the wise man. Um, so on the stature, on the uprightness of the, of the wise man, which he quotes several times in the chapter of what others think. But there's another one on character, on character that he kept um, he kept mentioning. I thought I I am really interested in reading. No, that's it. That's that's the one. It's Seneca's on the constancy of the wise man. Something I don't see quoted often, um, but something just piques my interest. Um, it's it's all about character. It's all about how one should stand upright, not literally in terms of character and integrity, um, that kind of upright, um, that I think doesn't get enough 
uh, like, or it could also could just simply um, lend us fodder for a book of the month if we want to focus on a series of essays by Seneca, which ones to choose from, or to focus on Seneca one month and um, and just have a couple of discussion meetings where we just read some of his essays um, on certain topics. Um, also, what's nice is that this could also help us um, determine what we may want to read some months for non-Stoic philosophers. Montaigne looks great. I would love to read some Montaigne, just based judging by this book. Um, I don't know about you guys. Is there is there anybody he quotes in this book that you were like, hmm, I, that stands out. He's not Stoic, but it would be interesting to read him because um, I mentioned Montaigne is somebody I might want to go to earlier than the others, but there, there, are, there, there are others in here I thought were interesting. Um, but did you mention Adam Smith? Smith? No, not, not yet, but you're right. Yeah, he does quote Adam Smith. I thought it was interesting. You know, it's, not the first time, it's not the first time that I hear Adam Smith in the Stoic circles. Um, uh, my, my field is it's economics and and I am I'm shocked. I've never. I, I still want to know what of the stoicism Adam Smith has to tell the truth. That, that has me really curious. Yeah, that's the thing is that you know him for the wealth of nations. You know him for um, here it is. You know him for his economic theory of capitalism, or at least the capitalism he envisioned. Um, and then all of a sudden, I see this big quote at the end of the chapter on externals, the last page. He quotes, a, he quotes from uh, Adam Smith, who literally quotes the Stoics. I mean, Adam Smith, Adam Smith literally says, human life, the Stoics appear to have considered blah, blah, blah. He, so Adam Smith has read the Stoics, which is huh. you know interesting to think about the fact that an economist would have been so read in such a classical, non-economically focused philosophy. And then in addition, the essay he writes this in is the theory of moral sentiments. So it's interesting to see that Adam Smith wasn't just an economist. He had an interest, genuine interest in moral philosophy. So it's, it would be interesting in the future to maybe have a session where we just read one of these non-Stoic philosophers and what they had to say about the Stoics or moral philosophy in general that I had never known they wrote about, you know. Um, of course. And now, Actually, yeah. Adam Smith is uh, well known for his uh, theory on moral sentiments, but uh, I guess his... Uh, uh, in the modern world, we're, we're less interested in in the moral sentiments than economy. That's why he's he's more famous in the in the economy. But he, his theory on moral sentiment is really uh, quite a good work. That's good to know. Yeah, we'll read that then in the future. Absolutely, because yeah, as somebody as somebody who is not trained in philosophy, he, you know, I'm, I'm, I dabble in it. I'm interested in it. But somebody who's not trained in it probably would never have been pointed to it. Like if 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 I if I go searching on the internet and you know what's my philosophy of the month I want to read about, um, rarely are you going to hear moral philosophy from Adam Smith. I don't, for me, anyway. Like even even moral philosophy your political philosophy you would more hear you would, you would more hear about um um Locke and Rousseau and um those who had um from his from a, a, a similar era um but I would have never thought Adam Smith from somebody untrained in philosophy who only hears Adam Smith in the, in the context of his of his wealth of nations it's you know it's it's good to know though that um that it's a good it's a good work to read um and uh, we'll definitely read these works in here. Montaigne, Schopenhauer also seems like a good one. Um, uh, and and Smith, absolutely. Um, that's it. I mean, unless you guys had any closing remarks, I kind of wanted to close out now with, um, with, first of all, a big thank you for everybody who joined us today. Um, because I know this, uh, it was, uh, um, it's kind of been a dull two weeks for the Berlin Stoics. Usually we have these really, really interesting every Thursday discussions, but I've been kind of going back and forth with something online, something in person. Um, I've only been able to do one a week. And then the technical hiccup last week literally forbid me to do anything digital, um, uh, anything digitally communicative, um, uh, kind of put us on, has put us on a little bit of a, uh, um, a wait until we get into that rhythm again, which I want to get back into. Um, well, thank you, Steve. Uh, just to echo what 
Nelly mentioned, thank you for organizing this event uh, and staying grateful to every single one and to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alvaro, um, and also thank you for your support. Like you, 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 you four have been um, semi consistent to consistent members of the Stoics. All of you have been somewhat regular, and this is not your first meeting with us. So thank you guys for your continued support um, and kind of just being there. Um, if you're not, if you don't consider yourself a Stoic, um, somebody who thinks that has it's a philosophy to offer something to you. Um, and that's something that we should engage in. The last thing I want to mention is uh, if you're interested reading the next book of the month, it's not a book. If you go to our website and let me just pull up the link and copy it in the, in the chat for you guys. Uh, okay. Okay. So here it is. So if you go to that link, um, this goes to our websites page. That's our next book of the month. It's not a book. So um, this is somebody I've been wanting to read for a little while. Um, he was uh, in the Stoic world. He's, um, he's well known. Um, and so he's always been on my radar for somebody I just haven't read. And he read, uh, he was an American fighter pilot um, a U.S. fighter pilot um, who was was in the Vietnam uh, War, and as he was flying over um, some part of South Vietnam, he was uh, he had fell uh, out of his plane and parachuted down and was captured um, by the North, and at that point was um, considered a prisoner of war and um, had been tortured over a number of years, and then when he came back to the U.S. Um, he uh, started writing about Stoicism and his experiences in the war because as he was being tortured, um, uh, as he reports, he had already read Epictetus' Enchiridion. And so that was something that as he was in um, uh, being held prisoner kind of kept him, um, well, kept him alive because many people might just lose interest in living at some point. It is very reasonable to think that, that a lot of people might might feel so down at that point that it's just, it, it, it creeps into their minds that they just, um, it's a, it, they could either go mad or either mentally or physically. Um, and him, for him, he, he kept himself um, mentally fit, I guess you would say, or, or at least mentally um, with it because he remembered some of the things he read from Epictetus. But it, he goes on to explore why and how. And so this reading is a collection of three essays. It's not a book. He did write a book, um, but I, and I was really trying to search for it. Um, so it's, it's probably good I didn't find it free, <laughs> free online that I could find. Um, because it also gives us a break. We don't have to read anything at length. The three essays I mentioned in the event are three essays of about 20 to 30 pages long. So there are, there are no more than 60 to 70 pages in total. It's not a long breadth of pages to read. Um, it's less than, it's, it's just a short novel, you can call it. Um, uh, three essays, and um, they cover all the same things he would have said already in his book. Um, they're just condensed or they're just contributions to certain publications that summarize the same things that he says about um, Epictetus and how it has helped him in his real, real experiences in the war. Um, so yeah, um, that's our book of the month for October 14th. Yep, Thursday, October 14th, one, two, three, four weeks away. Um, yeah, so if you guys are interested, definitely read it. Um, it's in three essays, so it does give you guys the ability, and it, they are free online, um, to read one or two of them. You don't, if you cannot make all, all three of them. Two of them are connected though. So if you read Stockdale on Stoicism 1, um, that might be best to read before Stockdale on Stoicism 2. Um, but otherwise, any one of them is fine to read. Yeah, so. That's it, guys. Thank you. Um, and awesome. Thank you very much, Steve.
I'll post I'll post an event for next week. I'm debating Thursday or Saturday, but otherwise you guys will hear about it. So have a good evening and have a good weekend. You too. Thank anyway. you very much. Have a good